In this lecture, we're going to learn about Islamic art. I will quickly preface this lecture by saying that this is a very brief overview and in no way encapsulates Islam, the history of Islam, or its artwork. That said, hopefully this introduction will orient you a little bit more and hopefully get you excited to look a little further with people who are specifically researching Islam, its artwork, and its history. To learn about Islamic art, we're of course going to need to learn a little bit about Islam itself. Muslim, which is the Arabic word for one who submits to God, refers to a follower of the Islamic religion. Islam is based on the teachings of the Prophet Muhammad, who was born around 570 CE in Mecca, which is today's western Saudi Arabia. So Muslims believe that the angel Gabriel spoke to Muhammad and told him what would later become the Quran which is the Muslim holy book said to be the only text with the true word of Allah, which literally means God, but it's just the word used in Islam. It's not a separate type of God. It's the Arabic word for God, such that Arab Christians still use the same word. As with any religion, people are going to follow the rules to different extents, just based on their personal culture or how they grew up, where they live, personal decision, whatever the situation is. But, as the title suggests, the five pillars of Islam are the foundation upon which the religion is built. The first pillar outlines the belief in one God, Allah, with Muhammad as his messenger and prophet. The second pillar is prayer five times a day, at dawn, noon, mid-afternoon, sunset, and after dark. When Muslims pray, they face toward Mecca, which as we previously mentioned was Muhammad's place of birth, and they recite parts of the Quran, often using a prayer rug or mat. The third pillar is to give alms to the poor, which is basically just donating a calculated percentage of their income to those in need. The fourth pillar is to fast from food and drink during the daylight hours of Ramadan, which is the ninth month of the Muslim calendar, reserved for fasting and prayer as a community. The fifth pillar is to make pilgrimage to Mecca, as long as the person is financially and physically able, at least once in their lifetime. Moving on to luster wear, this is an ancient pottery technique that requires an oily metallic glaze. It has a low firing temperature which allows the metal to form a sheen on the surface of the vessel. This process was so complicated that ancient potters often equated it to alchemy which is the turning of simple materials into gold. It's complicated because the metallic sheen is really hard to control. Muslims in the Middle East were very proficient with inlaying. Inlaying is fitting small pieces of metal into carved recesses in another surface or form. The central hub where inlaying was perfected was primarily in Iran. Usually silver, gold, and copper were inlaid into brass, bronze, or steel. Next we have Islamic glasswork. They use glass blowing, casting, and hand manipulating with tools. Their glasswork also saw innovation with gilding, which is where you put a thin layer of gold leaf or gold paint onto an object, and enameling, which is similar but does not give an appearance of gold, rather an appearance of a glassy substance. Glass vessels were used for perfumes, oils, drinks, and other liquids. It was beneficial especially for storage as inventory could be taken by looking through the clear surface without having to open the vessel. So seeing Allah as the sole creator and maker of life, traditional Islam did not approve of the representation of living forms within visual art. It was seen as a challenge to Allah as if the artist was competing with the true creator by creating their own depictions of life. In addition, representing Allah or Muhammad, there was also the concern of idolatry, wherein believers were worshipping the idol or the icon rather than the being that it represented. As a result, text-based visual art, like calligraphy, became a really important Islamic art form because it avoided these complications. It enhanced the beauty of Allah's words without challenging them in any way. Decorative pattern found in textiles, mosaics, texts, 3D artworks, 2D artworks, and architecture are made up of complex and ornate repeating elements. Alongside calligraphy, decorative patterns made up the non-representational types of Islamic art. 
There were two primary types of patterns. The first was vegetal, as we see in this example here, which is plant-based repetition. Their style was arabesque, which includes flowing and curling scroll-like forms. The second type of patterns are geometric, and as its name says, it's based in shapes, relying on primarily combinations of circles, squares, stars, and multi-sided polygons. Mosques are the Islamic house of worship. Historically, mosques have separated men and women, with male worshippers praying in the communal prayer hall, with women being denied entrance, praying behind a partition, or in another area altogether. There are also certain prayers and times for prayers that are mandatory for men and not for women. And while this is the standard in some mosques today, it is not universal. There are some mosques that do not segregate by gender. And in response to feminist-led movements, there's also been female-led mosques and mosques dedicated specifically to women worshipping. Next we have minarets, which are the towers that mark the location of a mosque. And there's actually a church official who will climb this tower to the top balcony calling Muslims to prayer. And this official is called a muezzin. Another part of a mosque is a mirab which is located on the opposite of a minaret, and it looks like a niche or a little inlet or recess in the wall that points in the direction of Mecca. And as we see in this example, it looks very similar to a doorway, but it's obviously not the size of a room. Also in this example, we see evidence of calligraphy and mosaics. A madrasa is an Islamic theological school. It teaches the history of Islam and the interpretation of the Quran. These buildings are often decorated with extremely intricate designs and patterns, and many times they also include well-known verses from the Quran. An iwan was a large covered porch at the center of the madrasa. It was often decorated in calligraphy, glazed tile work, and geometric designs. It was also a popular aspect of Persian Muslim architecture and design. The Mughal Empire was a wide mix of cultures in the Indian subcontinent. It contained a variety of cultures and Indian and Persian religions, which led to a level of tolerance seen nowhere else in the world at that time. We also see an artistic shift as figural representation in art became encouraged instead of frowned upon. It was now seen as trying to honor God's handiwork through pictorial imitation. It also saw some inspiration from Western influences as a result of Baroque Roman missionaries visiting the empire. One of the most well-known and memorable pieces of Mughal art and architecture is the Taj Mahal, which is found in India. The white marble surfaces reflect different colors throughout the day, and the bulb-like structures on the top of the architecture almost appear weightless, with walls that look paper thin. The design was actually based on the Quran's description of paradise. This structure was created for the emperor's wife when she died. It actually houses her tomb, his tomb, and a mosque. In the 1960s, we see an art movement called the Modern Expressionist. It's seen primarily in the sedan, combining traditional calligraphy with abstract painting. Led by painter Ibrahim El Salahi, this movement sought to appreciate God's creative nature by meditating on his creations. The artist himself did this by combining motifs of Islam and modern abstraction in oil paint. He used abstract forms reflecting those in mosques, like in this example in the bottom. Other works by El Salahi use his techniques based in calligraphy and line work to react to the world around him, like in daily sketches, which we can see on the top example. Now I'm to the point where I'm going to flip through some contemporary artists. I've listed some brief descriptions of their artwork in an example, but please feel free to investigate them further if you want to see more of their work and learn more about their concepts. Here we see work by an American artist working primarily in 2D media. The artist is exploring her own identity as a first generation black American Muslim woman. Next we have an artist and designer from Egypt. This artist has a PhD in Islamic history and blends inspiration from Renaissance masters and Islamic culture by using abstract interpretations of texts from the Quran. Next we have an Iraqi painter and calligrapher who is inspired by global poetry and Arabic calligraphy while utilizing themes of humanity. 
We have another American who's a sculptor and performance artist. And her work focuses on alienation, displacement, assimilation, and fluidity. Next we have an Algerian-born Indian installation and video artist. Her artworks deal with migration, journeys, and identity, while also tackling topics like culture, nationalism, and belonging. And then we have an Iranian video, photo, and film artist. She investigates the position of women in religious and cultural value systems of Islam. She does this using film narratives that focus on gender, identity, and society. This Somalian artist is actually based in Canada and works in digital art. She practices Afrofuturism, which is a reclamation of black identity, often paired with science fiction, history, and fantasy. Speaking specifically about this work, the artist says there's something poetic about making a black woman the mother of the universe. She also looks at her representation, or lack thereof, in society, saying, If I, a non-hijabi Muslima, didn't feel seen, I can't imagine how a hijabi feels. Which is just a term for a woman who wears a hijab, or a religious head covering. Next we have this Swedish-based digital artist and illustrator. As an illustrator, she's focusing primarily on client-based art, working on commissions, which basically means she creates what her clients ask for as her job. That said, we can obviously see a theme of Muslim women in her work. Next, we have this French-born Tunisian calligrapher and installation artist. He believes the common ground of the human experience and aims to, quote, build bridges. His work is founded on love, respect, and tolerance. Next, we have a British artist and designer. Combining his personal style with traditional Arabic calligraphy, he actually coined his own style, calling it visual dicker, utilizing the English word for visual and the Arabic word for remember, reflect, or invoke. I think the so what for this lecture is pretty clear. As we discussed in our conversations about the canon and being centered around Western culture, a lot of us don't think about Islamic art when we think about art history, or even art now. Especially coming off of the heels of our previous lectures, it's interesting to see how traditional Islamic art handles religion in contrast to the way that we've seen like the Renaissance handling Christianity. Almost exact opposites to the way that we are used to seeing religion and art history. We're used to seeing divine stories in specifically human terms. So it's interesting to see how this time period, this religion, these places handled it totally differently. With the Islamic art we just talked about really heavily dealing with calligraphy and text, it brings up a lot of things about contemporary society, especially in advertising. The way that you write a text communicates almost as much as the text itself, especially when using the principles of design. For instance, where something's located, how large it is, what color is being used, the color relationships to other things on the page. All of those things are communicating something. And Islamic calligraphy is no different. Sometimes the calligraphy functions as a pattern, and other times it's definitely the forefront of the composition. All the while, it's challenging our concept of visual art and language. Does there have to be a distinction, or is the line blurred? I can't speak for you all, but I personally cannot read Arabic. So for me, I have a very different experience from someone who can. I'm having pretty much a solely visual experience. I have the knowledge that it is a word, but I can't read it, so I'm not getting that context or frame of reference in addition to the visuals. Instead of leaving you with a specific example or historical event to ponder, I want you to think about the contemporary examples used and how they relate to the historical examples. For the contemporary artists, I tried not to go too deep on too few and instead give you a brief introduction to several artists so you have more of a variety and spectrum of reference. And this is where my lecture concludes. As always, stay safe, make sure you get enough sleep, and I'll see you all in class.